Out of interest, um, how many startup founders are in the room today? Quite a lot. That's awesome. Um, I think that the, there comes a point where every startup founder sort of does some soul searching and asks the question, um, what, it, what is it that I actually want out of this? Um, and for, for me and uh, my co-founder, John, um, we kind of started out just wanting to solve this problem of helping people to type. Um, but after a while, you start thinking about this. And I guess we, we were very clear that we never wanted to, we never wanted to run a sort of maintenance business. Um, we were only interested in, in carrying on if we could see that we were growing and exploring new ideas. Um, and when, when we started talking to Microsoft uh, a couple of years ago, we weren't actively looking for an exit at the time. Um, but it kind of prompted one of those, one of those soul-searching sessions. And uh, I think you, you kind of look at, you look at the, the core growth engine of your own company. You know, what's generating the cash? Um, how, how likely is it that that will continue to grow? How likely is it that that will give you the opportunity to explore new areas of research and, and, and new concepts? And I guess you, when you're looking at a potential acquisition, you're asking, what's the opportunity to do that as an independent company versus what's the opportunity to do it with the resources and the, the reach of a, of a bigger company? Um, and for us, I think if, if we'd have felt that, being an independent keyboard, you know, keyboard AI text input company would give us the opportunity to keep growing and developing in, in a rapid way. I think we would have stayed independent. But we felt that sort of weighing things up, we would have a better chance of exploring some of these new ideas that we, that we wanted to explore as part of a bigger company. Um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, things played out as they did. I guess the final point is that we, we founded back in 2008. And so we've been around for a long time. We felt like we'd done pretty much everything you can do as a tech startup in London, had an amazing time. Um, and it sort of felt like it was time to, to start a new season. Makes sense. Um, well, let's turn to some of the practical applications of machine learning technologies. I mean, it's been a few years now since the idea of deep learning has really hit the mainstream in terms of a growing awareness of, of the applications in our day-to-day -day lives. And certainly, initially, it seems like a lot of them have been focused on areas like image recognition and language. Of course, there's a lot of excitement now about potential applications with healthcare, thanks to DeepMind's collaboration with the NHS. Um, I was just curious to know from you where you see some of the most interesting applications for deep learning technologies in the near term. Yes, yeah, so, it's a good question. Um, so I guess that perhaps there's two things I wanted to touch on. Um, one of them is something that, that Rhea mentioned actually a minute ago, which is that in, in machine learning uh, over the last 15, 20 years, and in deep learning more recently, um, we've got pretty good at solving tasks where we have a lot of data or we can generate a lot of data through reinforcement and sort of training on that domain and then working within that domain. Um, and the, for me, the most interesting things that are happening at the moment are where we're trying to build representations that cross domains. Um, so I've worked mostly in, in text and language uh, and... You know, we sort of went from uh, hand engineering language, linguistic features for our machine learning algorithms um, to gradually through representation learning and then um, elaborating that with, with deep learning. Um, and, but we're still really just learning representations for words. Um, and, and similarly in, in, in visual, uh, you know, we're learning representations for visual objects. And at the moment, we, 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 don't really, we don't really know how to learn these joint representations. We don't know whether the types of structures that, um, that emerge from the approaches that we use today are really appropriate for learning multi-domain representations. Um, but, but anything, I mean, there was some work a couple of years ago around uh, analyzing images and generating text. And this feels to me like the start of, of something where we're trying to think about how, how you, you scale from one domain into other domains. So that's one thing. The other thing I actually think is really interesting is the application of deep learning to control theory. Um, and it seems like you know, we've, had, we've had vacuum cleaners 
that kind of half work, robotic vacuum cleaners, for about a decade. Um, <clears throat> but it's so difficult to scale from something pretty simple that knows you know, how to avoid basic objects into something that in any way can handle the kind of complexities of the physical world. Um, and I think if we can start to see the same kinds of increases in abilities that we've seen in, in areas like speech recognition and machine translation um, in control theory, then I think that, that could be really interesting because there are just so many applications um, that, that are, are nascent at the moment. I think this is a really good point as we're talking about the growing sophistication of deep learning to turn to the question of moral and legal agency. Now, as we all know, deep learning algorithms are taking an increasingly number of very important decisions that affect our day-to-day -day lives, and yet within our legal framework, we don't yet grant them the status of moral or legal agents. Now, that's a problem predominantly for questions of accountability. Who's at fault when something goes wrong? Is it the person who designed the algorithm? Is it the person who fed it the wrong data set? We don't really know. So I was curious to hear a bit more from you about how do you think our conceptions of justice and the way we approach moral agency, indeed the role we assign to the concept of agency, is going to need to develop as deep learning evolves? Well, I think this is really interesting because uh, the, the sort of questions around um, regulation of, of automated agents um, and, and how that ties into our existing justice systems has, has prompted, for me, a lot of questions about um, ethics and morality. Um, that are just philosophically interesting. So um, I guess I talked about control theory and, and automated vehicles, you know, self-driving cars are probably going to be um, the major application of, of uh, some form of, of robotics over the next five to ten years. Um, and and that, that raises the obvious questions that I'm sure we've all, we've all come across around, you know, if a, if a driverless car has to make a decision between one action and another, and, and the consequences of both are pretty bad. So, you know, it's, it's do, you, do you save the passenger of the car or the, the, the person who's just stepped out onto the crossing? Um, these kinds of questions historically have, uh, have been, been solely in the domain of, of human judgment. Um, and I think it, it, it's really interesting because once, once you start talking about automated agents, you realize that they're, they're not, these are not self-aware agents. And if self-awareness uh, is, is a requisite for punishment, essentially, in our current legal system, um, how, do we, how do we apply that to automated agents? It sort, of, it sort of stops making sense. You can't punish something that's not self-aware. It doesn't make any, diff any sense. And it won't make any difference to that agent. Um, so then you start to think, well, what does this mean? Um, and, and actually, if you look at, at uh, models of human agency, um, it also starts to become clear that actually things are much muddier than we would like to believe there as well. So, you know, whether a person is really a, a sort of self-aware agent of their own actions, how much they, they uh, have the ability to choose their own courses of behaviour, um, I think is, it, you know, there's a lot of work that suggests that we are much more, that the higher order reasoning in the human brain is much more about storytelling than about decision making. So we essentially see ourselves do things and then tell ourselves stories about why we're doing them and what kind of person that makes me. And, um, and, and actually, the, the automated agents are kind of just doing the same things, except they don't have this storytelling higher order ability. Um, but that, that makes, I think this should make us question whether the concept of, of penile justice, of punishing agents, is really the right model for any kind of regulation or justice. Um, and, and for me, I think we need to take much more seriously the kind of consequences-based ethics, which doesn't look for uh, victims and culprits, but looks for the, the overall best outcome. And the question for me is how do we apply data to our systems of regulation and say that you know, a, a good regulation is something that measurably reduces our metric of suffering, whatever, whatever, it, whatever we choose um, as, as the metrics upon which we base our decision making as, as a society. So I think, I think we're going to have to grapple with this, but hopefully it will, it will force us to rethink
how we construct our systems of regulation and justice in a broader sense. And that will be really traumatic, but I feel it's something that, that we need to do. I think it's really interesting, though, because of that very storytelling ability, there's a real question here about whether that sort of non-punitive framework, whilst it might, on the basis of, say, a cost-benefit analysis, work out better for all of us, whether that's going to be able to be adopted intuitively and whether, whether our instincts, mm. when it comes to retribution, will be able to be overcome. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I think this would, be, this would be an interesting point uh, to turn to the differences between machine learning algorithms and human learning. So as most of us here know, obviously, deep learning is at least in part based on what we know about how the human brain learns through reinforcement learning. But there are also some very important differences. I was curious to know from you sort of where do you see these main differences to lie and to what extent do you think that's going to be an impediment in our quest to attain artificial general intelligence? Yeah, I think this is a discussion that, that um, is, is very interesting and perhaps somewhat neglected. Um, I think it's very easy to look at the successes of machine learning and, and deep learning as the, the sort of latest instantiation of, of our obsession with getting machines to do useful stuff. Um, and, and it does, you know, we, we look at our achievements and it, it, it's pretty impressive, the types of things we can do. Um, the output, you know, um, we're now better at recognizing objects using deep learning than we are, than any one individual human is. Um, we're, we're, we, can, we can translate from far more languages through a machine than any, uh, than any individual. And obviously there are, there are plenty of areas where you can see we're not quite at the level of the human brain. But if you just look at the output of these tasks, you know, you could, you could, you could believe that we really are sort of racing towards this, this uh, human level intelligence. But if you actually look at how the learning occurs, it's completely different. So machine learning in, in the past, uh, successful machine, learn, machine learning has always been about supervised, uh, supervised pattern recognition, essentially. So we have some, some set of data uh, that with some set of labels, and we learn from that to, to, to predict those labels in some form or another. Um, and this is sometimes uh, sort of augmented or reinforced with unsupervised learning, where we acquire some information about uh, the, the domain that doesn't require those labels. And then um, I think the, uh, the, the recent advances in reinforcement learning are, are again, a, a, a different model and in many ways uh, a, a, it feels like a step in the right direction. But essentially, we still require learning from vast quantities of data. And I think you know, the sort of fundamental difference is that the human brain, um, certainly the, the trained human brain, learns from actually very, very few examples of data, very few data samples. Um, and the, you know, we talked a bit about, about transfer learning today, and, that, and that's really important. But the, the trained human brain is 99% transfer learning and 1% acquisition from you know, raw data. Uh, and, and that uh, a way to think about this, this disparity for me is when, when machine learning started in the 50s, uh, we, we, we created systems that, um, that mimicked the way the conscious brain works. So manipulating symbols um, to, to achieve outcomes. And we found that this was, was hopelessly brittle. And when you try to, try to bring that into the real world, it just doesn't work. Um, so then we kind of scrapped that and, and went back to uh, learning from very s relatively simple statistical models and feeding them with, with vast oceans of data um, that, that started to become available over the last decade, 15 years. And this, this is sort of, if you think about the way the brain works, the conscious mind is right at the tip of the iceberg. And that kind of conscious symbolic manipulation is, is what we're all aware of. Um, and the, the kind of models that we have based on things like um, uh, neural networks are sort of right at the bottom level. You know, we're essentially modeling the, the basic neuron. Um, and it's all of that stuff in between that we really, at the moment, we have no idea of. And it's that stuff in between that really allows complex representations and the interaction between those complex representations. Um, and I think, I think that 
for me, you know, if we think about what's the journey between where we are today and AGI, um, it's, it's getting towards what is that, that middle layer. And we don't really know whether that's, you know, 20 different logical layers within that, all that function slightly differently, um, or whether it's three or four, or whether it's sort of one seamless uh, progression from these very, very uh, low order basic concepts to these higher order um, logical concepts. Um, but, but I think there's just such a huge amount of work to do to get there. And it's fascinating work. But, but certainly at the moment, um, we're a very long, we're, we're, we're oceans apart in terms of how, what we do with things like deep learning and what the human mind does. It's much like you were talking about how the manifest problems we can see with the notion of agency when applied to machine learning algorithms demonstrates actually the fiction of agency when it comes to human actors. I do wonder, do you think that it will flip at some point where instead of studying biological systems in order to build interesting models for it to work in algorithms that we'll actually be able to get a better understanding of the human brain by way of observing machine learning algorithms at work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of... It's an unknown and it's fascinating. You know, what, what, what will emerge about our understanding of the way intelligence works through you know, all the, all the uh, institutions and companies that are focusing on this problem and you know, trying to solve the next, the next most difficult problem, whether it's you know, with DeepMind, the, how do you play Quake once you can play Atari? Um, whether it's with self-driving cars, how do you navigate country roads? you know, as well as motorways, um, out of trying to solve these problems may come um, a, a better understanding of how intelligence fundamentally works in the human mind. But I think we just don't know. We also might just be going down very different paths. Mm. So I'm fascinated to, to find out where that goes. Mm.